and we'll start. And then the first thing I'm going to say is, pro and this is um, kind of beginning vegetable cold crops. And Lindsay, if there's something that you really would like to hear about a vegetable, uh, Marilyn said she's game for anything. Uh, let me know. Just write it in the chat, and I can I can make sure I talk about it a little bit. But the first thing that I want to show you is this little book right here, and this is. We actually carry it. You can get it at the extension office also. Um, it is uh, actually available on the internet too. If you go into um, K-State Extension Publications, um, it's a pay book. Um, if you get inside, it has nice colored pictures and stuff like that. Uh, but they do have it online. That, I mean, you could print it off if you wanted. It just won't, well, I guess it depends on the kind of printer you have. But, um, this is put out by K-State. I love it because of Kansas on that. This is geared to the state. You know, it talks about, um, if you look at one of the pages, it actually shows you the, the a diagram of the state and the counties. So it'll, it's very specific to Kansas. It has um, uh, chapters that are like planning, planning a garden, composting, soil improvement, seeds, as it grows, watering, fall gardens. And then the, the, in the back, it takes each individual crop, like radishes, varieties, when to plant, spacing, care, harvest, problems. So it takes each one and goes through it. And then probably the thing that we use the most, I'm gonna show you a different one is this because it's easier to handle, is this is our little, um, it's a planting guide, a planting and harvest guide. The light colored boxes show you when to plant, and then the dark boxes show you when to harvest on that. And we, you, we, I don't know how many of these copies we give away of this because we just Xerox it off and, and hand it to people. But um, it's, it's really, really nice and, and very helpful as far as that goes. And like I say, if you don't want to get it, you can get it on the internet too. And just bookmark it and you have it. But it's a really handy, handy guide on that. So today we're gonna to talk about, um, I'm gonna say cool season vegetables. Um, and you're gonna find that vegetables, there's two different, um, I'm gonna say seasons. On it. You've got the early season ones, which these can take some cold weather. And then you have the warm season ones, which they can't take any cold weather on that. The advantage, um, or a, a, a more of a FYI for you and uh, extend the season, just about everything we're talking about can be done again in the fall. If you look at the um, harvest plant sheet, it'll, it'll have two, like it says on beets. You plant from late March to, to mid-April. You harvest June, July. You plant end of July to the middle of August and you harvest again in September, October. So you can do most of, excuse me, most of these again in the fall. And some of them I think actually do better in the fall than they do in the spring. Probably the only exception to it is our peas. And the reason being is peas need cool weather for our cool soil to germinate. And the soil is not cool in August on that. So that's probably the only exception. But to give you an idea of things that will, um, our, our cool season crops that you'll plant early, um, and there's a pretty good list. You know, you're talking beets, Swiss chard, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, cauliflower, broccoli, Carrots, um, if you want to try celery, celery, uh, potatoes, kale, lettuce, onions, rhubarb, spinach, turnips, peas, they can all be done. So there's quite a few that you can do in the fall, in the spring, and still get a good garden. Now, some of these you're going to plant from plants, from transplants, and some you can do, um, I would say, do from seed. Also, you will find that there's some, like you can find lettuce and spinach plants, kale, uh, plants, and you can also do um, seed from those. So um, you, you'll find that there's some that you can do that way, just depending on what works for you on that. Um, <clears throat> the, most of these, the, the cabbage, cauliflower, and broccoli, uh, and I'm gonna say Brussels sprouts are all in the same family. Okay, now, your success is gonna be exactly like I talked about them, cabbage, cauliflower, broccoli, and Brussels sprouts. The reason that, the, okay, let's say Brussels sprouts is the worst, and I, I tell people, don't cry if you don't get a harvest, because they need a long growing season, 
And what happens is we go into heat faster than they like, and so then they bolt. When they bolt, what they do is they go to seed. And when they do that, they're bitter and they don't, they don't finish producing a Brussels sprout or a broccoli or a cauliflower or whatever they're growing on that. So um, the, sh the shorter the maturity, the better, the better chances of you getting a crop as far as that goes. Um, and some of them can take a little bit more um, heat than others, like the cabbage. I mean, it still doesn't like it really hot, but it can take a little bit more so than the, the broccoli on that. When you, uh, kind of an FYI for you, um, generally on cabbage, when you plant it, you get one head and that's it. Last year, I actually, we had some here that we actually got second little, um, little baby heads later on, which you don't see very often. Now, broccoli is, um, I don't know if you can say the exact opposite, but broccoli has a big head. You know, you go to the grocery store and buy it, you got this big head of broccoli. That's what it looks like. But if you leave it alone, it'll send off side shoots and you can have a second crop. Um, really, you don't get a second crop with cabbage or cauliflower, but you can with broccoli on that. Uh, Brussels sprouts, um, again, okay, I don't do Brussels sprouts, so I don't even know what they look like in the store. But my guess is they're a little bit smaller. The, the Brussels sprout itself is a little smaller than you would buy in the store, just because we don't have a long enough season. Uh, last year was actually a halfway decent year for growing those. Um, I don't know if you remember, but it wasn't, it didn't get super hot. And it didn't, it took a long time to, to warm up, so to speak. And so it was, a, I saw some that I was like, oh, wow, I've never seen them like that around here on that. Of course, I can say this, I haven't seen very many around here because uh, most people will try them and then give up because it seems like all I'm doing is growing those and spending all my time and effort and I'm not getting anything out of it. So probably next year, the ones I saw won't have that good of luck on that. Uh, but as far as um, timing, I'm going to say peas are probably the first to plant. Uh, actually, some of the old timers, um, this is not the year to do that, but some of the old timers will tell you if you don't plant your peas in February, you're too late. Um, which actually you could probably still do it on Monday or Tuesday because I think Tuesday's the first, but you can still get it in. Um, peas are one, if you open up the package, you plant them from seed, uh, you look at it and it's got, sh they're, they're not the peas that you would put on your plate. They're all shrinkled and, and riveled, or no, shrunk and ri shriveled, sorry. <laughs> and um, what the, to speed it along, soak them in water overnight or soak them for a few hours before you plant them. That kind of gets them puffed up and start start the process and then they don't have to sit in the ground and soak up moisture from the ground on that. So that's an easy way to kind of speed those up. Uh, peas are kind of vining trend, tendrils. Um, it works really well to put them on some sort of a, a fence or a, or a trellis or something or plant two rows close together and let them twine into each other on that. There's there's peas that you that you hull or shell there's also um, probably most of them that we sell are the ones that you eat pod and all on that, which is much to me much better than trying to hull peas. Peas you just you spend a lot of time and effort and don't get a lot for it. I think on that, but um, then probably the next things you will plant are things like the lettuce, the spinach. Spinach is actually a little more cold hardy than lettuce, um, and kind of jumping a little bit. Uh, if you plant spinach and lettuce in the fall. Now it needs to be of some socks. It isn't that you plant it and then say, okay, I can plant this in November and it'll come up and grow all winter. No, it doesn't really grow through the winter, it survives. And then when spring rolls around, what happens, it takes off and goes. And let, or, uh, spinach is the one that just floors me. I've had spinach that I've overwintered that when the leaves, when it comes on in the springs, the leaves are bigger than my hand on that because it just likes that environment. Um, Lettuce isn't quite as cold hardy. So, uh, now mine didn't make it. I still have spinach from last fall. Now it's not very big, but I know that um, once it warms up, it's going to take off and go. Now I did cover them. I've got a cold frame and I put it on that, uh, put that on the spinach. Um, you can also use plastic. Um, you could use old windows, things like that, all kinds of different things to make a little cold frame. Uh, but that's, you know, kind of a, a FYI how to extend the season, so to speak, on that. Uh, but uh, spinach, lettuce can be planted from seed or uh, uh, plants on that, either one. Uh, the seed, uh, and this is true with all your seeds, lettuce, spinach, carrots, beets, uh, radishes, 
uh, I don't know if I'm missing something. Those are ones that you really want to thin them some when you plant. And when I say thin them, okay, you're gonna throw the seed out. Um, if you're in a raised bed, forget about rows. Just do a block. You know, if you're in the garden, um, I may even say the same thing. Forget about rows if you don't have a big, you know, if you don't have a tiller, you don't run the tiller over it. You know, you see all the rows of the vegetables and you, you go down there, that looks really neat. But look at the garden itself. See how huge it is. Well, what, that's why they have the tiller because then they can keep, keep up with it on that. If you have a smaller garden, whether it's a raised bed or in the ground, uh, plant in blocks, okay? And then have a pathway. This is my pathway. This is on the ground. This is my pathway that, okay, I can go down and maybe I can reach both sides or I can do two pathways and I can pretty much stay on the pathway and harvest my crops. Because when you step into that soil, I don't care what you weigh, you're gonna compact the soil on that. So that keeps it you know, in one area and you could actually maintain that as a, a pathway the whole time. You could rotate around depending on what you want. But that way, you know, rather than plant them six inches apart when they only need to be four inches apart, you can get more crop per space. And actually in the back of, well, I'm thinking of it, in the back of the book, it has um, the second to the last page. They just call it vegetable crop information, but it'll give you, um, okay, we'll take beets. It says beets are your average spacing within the row is, I lost my place, is two to four inches. And then it says between the rows, 18 inches. Well, you don't have to put them 18 inches apart. They're, they're telling you when they're two to four inches apart, that's how big they're gonna grow. So you could put those every two or four inches and then just have a block of them. And that's an easier way a lot of times to take care of stuff. So, and if you, you can, um, some of these seeds are really small, uh, but radishes and actually beets are one that they're pretty good size um, seeds. So you, if, you know, I'm not planting a hundred foot of it, you could take an individual seed and put it in there and just do a plant and then you don't have to, see, to um, thin, okay? Now, keep this in mind with beets. Beets um, are, you plant one seed, but it's actually several seeds in that pod. So when it comes up, you're gonna have three or four plants in there. You will need to thin those if you want some decent sized beets. Um, carrots and lettuce, are relatively small seeds, so you may say, um, I can't even see these, uh, and just, just top dress them. Take, or side, or not top dress them, but just scatter them over the top. If you're worried about getting too much or too close, you're still gonna have to thin. Put them in like a salt shaker or some kind of herb container that has the um, shaker type thing on it, and do that way. That's a good way to spread them out. If it's still, you know, if the holes are really big, Put, some, put a little bit of soil or a little bit of sand with it. That way it distributes, as, you know, mix it up because what's gonna happen is something's gonna settle to the top, something settle to the bottom. But you can do that and that's a way to do it also on that. So, um, and, and you think, well, I just won't, I won't thin because I, you know, I want all those. You know, if you put them too close together, they're not gonna produce as well as they potentially can or they're not gonna produce. You know, carrots are one. You don't thin them, you're gonna pull out a carrot and you have a great big top and you have a, uh, a carrot smaller than your pencil, you know? And so it's really frustrating to spend all that time and effort on it and then find out, oh shoot, I didn't get anything out of it. So that's probably, um, besides weeding, that's probably your most tedious job. Uh, but it's, you know, I, I say let's, it's gotta be done on that. So um, uh, you also, some of these seeds, um, some of them like uh, carrots uh, and even radishes sometimes too, uh, not radishes, uh, lettuce, I'm sorry. Uh, they're slow to come up. The seeds are really small. It's hard to, you know, sometimes you can get a crust, uh, a layer of uh, hard, I'm going to say hard compacted soil. Not that you stepped on it, but you've watered it. It crusted over. That, little, that plant is so little, it can't shove its way through. Plant a few radishes with it. The radishes are not, are going to be ready long before the other stuff is. It pops up and it breaks up the soil and it's a little easier for those other plants to grow. Now, you're not going to plant a bunch of radishes, but you're going to plant two or three, maybe put them, you know, every two or three or, or three or four inches apart so that they'll bust up the soil, but they're not going to mess up that. And now I don't have any lettuce because the radishes took over that type of thing. And hopefully you like radishes because then you can do it. Now, uh, succession planting is when you take 
and okay, I'm gonna harvest this lettuce. I like lettuce, so I want a lot of lettuce. Well, don't plant the whole package at once because it's all gonna ripen at once. So plant some, wait 10 days, two weeks, plant another batch, wait 10 days, two weeks, plant another batch. That way you have some, ri some that's ripe. The next one's gonna be already in about a week or 10 days. So I've got the first one eight, I can eat do this one. So you can do that with quite a few of these. Um, the, and I'm gonna say lettuce, spinach, uh, uh, the beets, carrots, and actually beets and carrots, you can probably get by with just doing one batch because you can do some early and then they just keep getting bigger. And be and carrots particularly, I don't grow beets, so I'm, I would guess they're the same, but I'm not sure. Um, you can actually go into the summer with those. And if they like the cooler weather, you can get them started. Even though it turns um, hot in the summer, they're kind of just, I'm gonna say in suspended animation, they're just sitting there waiting to be pulled on that and you're fine. They're not gonna to go to seed the first year, they're gonna to go to seed the second year if they go to seed. So, and carrots actually are one that I would say plant some in the fall because the cooler weather in the fall and overwintering it, mulch it heavy, it'll overwinter. You pull those out in you know, December, January and they're a whole lot sweeter than they would be any other time hmm. of year on that. So, uh, so you do that. Okay, uh, potatoes. Uh, potatoes here are St. Patrick's Day. Um, you'll buy seed potatoes. Don't use the ones you get out of the grocery store because the ones in the grocery store have been treated so they don't sprout. Um, they have what they call eyes. That's where the sprouts come out. They're called eyes. Uh, and they'll tell you that uh, it depends on how big the potato is, but say if you had one that's about the size of a tennis ball, you'll cut it into quarters. Okay, now some people sit there and look at it and say, here's an eye and here's an eye and oh, here's one. And they try to cut around, just cut on that. <clears throat> Um, you know, you're going to get an eye. There's enough of them in there. You're going to get one. Uh, I would suggest um, they like they like to be planted in cooler weather, but if we get a lot of rain, they will rot. So what I would suggest doing is cutting them and leave them set a couple, three days so that they can kind of callus over and then plant them. That way they're not as prone if we happen to get a bunch of water right after it. They will be slow to come up, but they'll, you know, they'll come up and they're, they're easy to grow and they're really good when you grow your own. Um, onions are planted at about the same time. The sets, you will get plants, but you don't want to do onion plants until basically your chance of frost or you're close to the chance of frost on that. Here, our frost date, the average frost date is um, April 10, uh, yeah, April 10, April 15th in that range. Now, what that means is there's a 50-50 chance of having frost after that date. Each week, okay, the 10th, I'm gonna use a 10th because it's an easy number, okay? The next week is the 17th. So the week of the 17th, that chances decreases by half. So you have a 25% chance of, of frost, okay? The 24th of April, you have a 12.5% chance of frost. Then the 7th of May, you have, if I did the math right, I think I did it wrong, but um, let's just say another week later, you have six and a quarter chances. So you can see that you have, as you go along, you have less and less a chance of frost on that. That's considered the frost date. And then they have one called the frost free date, which means normally we do not have a frost after that, which that date is May the 10th on that. But it isn't always right because um, twice now in my lifetime, I've seen snow on May 9th and May 10th on that. So we're, you know, it, it's close, but you know, we'll deal with the frost when the time comes, if you have vegetables, I'm not going to talk about it right now. All of these things that we're talking about, these can take a little bit of frost. You know, that's why they're called cool season on that. So, um, okay. Uh, I have not talked about, I've talked about that. Um, I guess I've talked about all of them. Um, some of them, I haven't talked a lot about like Swiss chard, arugula, they're kind of in the same boat as your spinach and lettuce. You know, they're, they're grown to eat the greens. They'll take a, a cooler weather. Actually, not arugula, we do have Swiss chard. We will have Swiss chard in plants, but you can also plant the seed too on that. So um, the, on those, the, um, I'm gonna say the better the soil. Uh, you want a good light soil so that they can germinate. And um, you, lettuce actually needs light to germinate. The others really don't but you'll plant the seeds, keep it moist, try to keep it moist. Now, the best way to do this is either a watering can that has a spout, so it looks like it comes out like, not like a, a thunderstorm, but like a light shower, so that it, it uh, waters the soil, but it doesn't wash the soil. Because these seeds are small, 
you know, a lettuce is super small. Lettuce seed is probably, uh, probably about, if you took a, a straight pin and took the curved part of it at the bottom where it pokes you, they're about that size. So they're not very big. So you don't want to water them so heavy that it washes away because you may have just spaced those just right and you wash them away, they're all going to accumulate down at the bottom one big glob and you're not going to have anything that's going to be worth it. So um, try to keep them moist. Um, when you plant, when you take the plants and plant them, it's the same thing. Take those and uh, have good soil, plant them. Um, I would suggest using a starter solution like your root stimulator. Um, because what it does is it works on the soil's root system on that. It's um, uh, hormones that the plant produces naturally and fertilizer. So it can grow more roots because it has more, kind of like steroids basically. So, um, and that will get you started. I wouldn't worry, now, taking something like the garden coat and putting it below the plants that you're planting, not the plant that you're, the transplants, not your seeds, but the transplants. Um, is okay. I'm not super big on doing it on, on the cool season crops because they aren't going to be in the ground that long. So I would say, okay, go ahead and do, you know, the, the, the fox farm fruit and flower, the uh, uh, gardener special that you put underneath. Still, you put it underneath. Put it a couple, three inches below the, um, where you're going to have the plant. That way, there's no um, contact with the roots on that fertilizer because it can burn. Also, it has a time to get established and settled in, then the roots can start growing and aha, look what I found. But if you have it right there and it's, it's kind of like, okay, wait a second, I'm not ready for this full course meal, um, you can stunt it, let's say. So you wanna put it underneath. The things, most of the things we've been talking about that you're growing from seed, you want to do a, a top dress. In other words, you're gonna throw it over the top. Your, your lettuce, your spinach, your radishes, your, car your carrots will be a little bit longer. Those aren't going to be in the ground that long. So, and they don't have a huge deep root system. So you can throw it on top, it'll dissolve and it'll get it. Yes, it'd probably be a little bit better if it was in the ground, but I, I would guess that, um, it's, <clears throat> excuse me, it's going to be minuscule. You won't see the difference. The plant, if it could talk, would probably say, yes, I would prefer it under the roots. But then you would say, or, and so it's okay, it's okay, it's fine, I can take it on top. So, um, but yeah, you can top dress with those. And then remember, most of those fertilizers um, that I'm talking about are a one month thing. So if you pull, and this is your, your succession planning, okay? I took the lettuce out. Well, I, you know, in the meantime, you could have put a tomato there in the, a little bit later in the middle of the lettuce. It's not gonna last as long as a tomato. And so the tomato's growing, it's not in the way, and you've harvested all the lettuce, and now all of a sudden the tomato could take over. So you can do some things like that. The same thing with radishes. You can do the uh, a, a staggered them, like, you, like we talked about with the spinach and the lettuce, spinach, and radish can all be staggered. But yet, okay, I know that it's going to get hot. These, these radishes are going to turn bitter. But you know what? I can put a cucumber in here, or I can put um, a green bean. So you can do some things that you stagger with. Um, you know, that, okay, I'm going to, when you have a raised bed or a small garden, you want to utilize it to the max, and that's kind of what you're doing with that. But then, then what I'm getting at, I guess, the long, the long way around the bush is that if you water or uh, fertilize, okay, I fertilize this lettuce, and it's about done, and really I have two or three weeks left on my fertilizer, remember that when you plant your next thing in there on that. So you don't say, oh, I just planted this, I need to fertilize it. Make sure that you're not ODing it on fertilizer on that. And, and you want to give them some here's kind of what I tell people is, okay, do the farmers put fertilizer down? You know, they're doing this for a living. Yes, they do. They will take soil tests. You can take a soil test also. If you don't, we can give you a general recommendation, but they know what they need. Actually, now they have the, this is kind of more of information you need probably, but the farmers have, they take the field and they break it down into zones and they know that this area needs this much fertilizer and this area needs more or less. And so they fertilize the field based on what that soil is right there not what the whole field is on that so you can see how it's you know it's almost a science for what they're doing ours is more of an art you know we're going to try and throw this on and see what happens and if it doesn't make it that's the way it goes you know that type of thing okay um and i think uh i have uh i guess i should have said this at the beginning if you have any questions just type them into the chat we can do that 
but um, I kind of I kind of covered all of them. I'm going to say that I have down for uh, the cool season crops because usually I go till about seven and then hopefully then a few more questions. But so if you have a question, type it in. If you don't, that's fine. Um, and if I don't see questions, I'll just keep talking a little bit. But um, another thing you can do that might help a little bit uh, to kind of give you a little bit of an extension, let's say, maybe not that much, but some are your cold frames on that. Now, cold frames can be super fancy. You know, there's some you buy them and they have a thermostat in them and then they have, uh, uh, I don't know what you would call it, uh, a, a, a mechanism that it can open the lid if it's a certain temperature so it doesn't get too hot in there. But you can do the same thing yourself. You know, you can build one that you have a, a plastic, uh, I'm gonna say lid. Uh, you can do, I have, mine is, happens to be made out of, cause I happen to work at a garden center. Uh, mine's made out of old greenhouse film on that, the, the Lexan out of the greenhouse. We had some that was hail damaged and we made us a bunch of cold frames. Um, it's fairly light, you want it light cause you're gonna move it. Uh, but yet that's what I have over my spinach right now and I have the lid on. Uh, I think I've opened the lid twice this winter. I opened it once to see if it was doing fine and not obviously this snow, but the last snow as much as we had, I pulled the lid off because everything else was getting water and it wasn't. That's a key you have to remember is it doesn't get water from the rain. And I just took a whole bunch of snow and threw it inside and then put the lid back on. Um, I knew it wasn't the lid, the snow would be an insulator and it would melt. And so then it would get some water because I knew it was dry. So, but they'll, they'll give you, they're not going to be hugely uh, much more warmer than outside. Uh, you know, they say five to 10 degrees, but what it's going to do is it's going to protect you from the wind, which a lot of times makes a lot of difference. It's also going to be on an, a warm day. It's going to be much warmer in there. Um, you probably all have walked into a greenhouse and say, oh, wow, this is so nice. When you come on a cold day, that's what it's like on that. And it takes longer to break down. And the plant is... I'm going to say relatively happy. So even though it cools down a lot at night, it's still happy that it can survive. So it will keep it, give it a little bit of protection. It can give it enough protection on a night that he, oh, you know what? This sucker will go down to 28 pretty easy, but it's supposed to be 25 tonight. So it may give you enough protection that you don't have to worry about something like that. Um, and you can do that. You can do old windows. You know, I, I got a new door. I got windows replaced. Keep them. They're, they're great for things like that on that, that you can just build a little box or you can even, uh, you could take, I've done this before, it's not as, as warm, but I just took and put bricks and put it right on top on that. And it gave me some control, it, it gave me some warmth then. So there's different ways you can use them, but um, it could be something that you're interested in now. It could be, okay, wait a second, let's start with, let's start little and work our way up on that. Um, and there's also um, what they call frost blankets you can buy that are uh, different lengths. I think, I don't even know, we have some and I don't know what the length is and the width, but um, it's a blanket that you put over. Again, it's not gonna give you five or 10 minutes, um, uh, five or 10 degrees, it's probably gonna give you two or three. But if that plant, you know, and I'm gonna jump and say, okay, if we had a tomato and it got down to 30 and that gave me three degrees, that means the tomato didn't die on that. Where if I didn't have it, the tomato might've died on that. And so sometimes it can be a little bit of insurance. And I put that on my strawberries in the winter on that. And I could actually put it on my uh, uh, spinach and lettuce if I didn't have my cold frame. My cold frame just makes it so much easier for that. So some years I don't make it, but most years I, most years I have spinach. I don't always have lettuce, but a lot of times I have spinach on that. Okay. A couple of commercials and then we'll call it. Um, we are having um, next Thursday, is the vegetables garden um, cool season, or I'm, I'm sorry, warm season crops, like your uh, peppers, your melons, your cucumbers, that type of thing. Um, I am going to, uh, I will, we will not do tomatoes because we're gonna do tomatoes as a, as a separate one on that. So, um, and Marilyn, the other gal just left. And so the next thing I was gonna say is what I said with, to you is that Saturday I have one on the uh, beginning vegetable garden. So hopefully, um, maybe I'll see you then. And you said you would, so hopefully we will. So if you don't have any questions, I'm gonna call it. Okay, sounds right. good. Thank you so very much. Okay, how did I do? Oh, it was, I got a lot of good information. So good, I good, okay. It. Thank I, you. The, the bad thing about doing it on Zoom is you get no feedback. You know, when you do uh, yes. it, 
when we do it in person, we make everybody fill out a survey. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> we kind of know. So, okay, awesome. Well, then, all uh, right. We'll Thanks, man. Okay, take care. Bye. Bye bye. Uh, record stuff.